right. Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, we've had, uh, we have a little competition from, uh, from France. Um, but um, this is uh, about America first, so we're going to talk about America first. And appreciate it. There will be people, I think, entering uh, as, we, as we talk. So I want to introduce our panelists and thank them all for being here. Uh, so uh, first, we have uh, Senator Corker uh, from Tennessee, the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Jin from the London School of Economics. Um, we have uh, uh, Deputy Prime Minister Hasbani uh, from Lebanon. Uh, we have Secretary General Almagro from uh, the Organization of American States. And we have Robert Kaplan, a senior fellow at the Center for a New American Security. Thank you all for uh, participating. So I wanted to start off with uh, a general question, which is, how do the let's, uh, I'll start with uh, uh, Secretary General Almagro. How do the citizens in the countries that you re represent think of America first? And how do you think of America first? What does it mean to you? What is the message that it sends to you? First, uh, I'm tempted to speak Spanish. I, I don't know if it is fine for everybody. Um, primero, creo que el pensamiento América primero es... Uh, we'll, maybe we need to get some... Oh, uh, yes. No, no, so... I, I think everybody was no, expecting... No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So definitely yeah, we'll... Yeah, have to thank you. I think we need some... Yeah. Apologies. And I think for the panelists, too, might be helpful. <laughs> we can get them for the panelists. <laughs> there's no translation, I think. It, there's no translation. <laughs> no translation. Uh, well, uh, do you want to try in English? Or do I you try in English. OK. Yes. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, first of all, this is uh, uh, I would say a very charming slogan, because uh, considering that I was born and raised and in this continent, in the continent, the American continent, plus now I am the head of an organization that includes all the countries of the Americas. So America first is a sort of a charming uh, <laughs> slogan. <clears throat> uh, nevertheless, in a second thought, uh, maybe I am not included there, and that is a... Uh, it completely makes the approach completely different in many ways. Uh, the, the thing about American First is, uh, in, in many ways, um, not something uh, new for uh, Latin American citizens or Caribbean citizens. We have seen administration after administration always uh, giving, priori giving priority to the American interest above everything else in the world. Uh, we have enjoyed that sometimes, and we have suffered that many times. Nevertheless, uh, our approach always is to wait and see, because we have to accommodate always to a new American administration, and try to take the best, try to be helpful sometimes, and of course, uh, try to protect or defend our interest when, it, when it's necessary. What we see uh, these days, we have a sort of an advantage in many ways. That is, uh, uh, the message of this administration is quite clear. Uh, second, uh, it is not so distant from the principles and values that we defend in the organization of American state in many cases. Uh, for example, the message of the administration about uh, the dictatorships in Venezuela and in Cuba is very strong, much stronger than the previous administration. And that, of course, makes uh, the things easier to work. Plus, um, as head of the organization, I, can, I can't complain, because uh, the American administration has been very supportive of our uh, work uh, in defending democracy in the continent and protecting human rights. What we see that uh, the main differences are, of course, in in some issues uh, that uh, are related to mainly to migration, and sometimes trade. Uh, migration, uh, the, the main problem is, is, is the rhetoric. 
is, uh, if we see the number of the deportations of the, the previous administration, this much more, many more than, than, than this administration. Uh, uh, if we see uh, this concept, uh, the wall, the wall already exists partially. It's a legacy of two administrations before. Yeah. So uh, there are hundreds of miles of wall already, and those hundreds of miles of wall cost the lives of 500 at least Latin Americans every, every year. So that is not so, not so much, it's not so different. The rhetoric is different, and the approach is different, and that is something that is our concern, <laughs> and of course we are, we are uh, struggling right. with that. Let me, let me, let me ask uh, yes. Deputy Prime Minister Hosdani, what, how, how do you, what is the message to you? How do you feel the citizens of Lebanon and perhaps in the broader Arab world see this? Well, for, first of all, the expression of America first uh, it's, is seen differently by different people. Some people see it as a sign of relief because they believe in the past intervention from the United States uh, in affairs in the region has not been extremely constructive. Others see it as uh, a major shift uh, in terms of potential uh, solutions for the region or in a way, unfinished business uh, that has been stopped somewhere in the right in the middle of its um, uh, evolution, uh, which means more chaos and more uh, trouble and problems. So different people see it differently. However, if we go back to the key principle, uh, it's not surprising to me that a country would put its interests first. And that's a natural cornerstone of any strategy. Uh, whether it's less focused on foreign policy, more focused on local affairs, this is just the order of business, I guess. But in the end, no global power can actually disengage completely from international affairs, not even smaller countries, let alone a, a global power. But what it means to a region like the Middle East is that some selective intervention has been observed within this America First uh, approach. In many ways, it is also seen as there's no clarity on where the US wants to go with its policy with respect to the Middle East. Non-state actors are there. They still exist. They're being eliminated <coughs> partially, but they exist from different backgrounds, not just from one background. At the same time, state actors are there, and they're also dealing with each other in a highly polarized environment. There are re-emerging forces and global forces coming back to the region, particularly Russia. And uh, a lot of action is taking place. We see troubled countries um, revolutions turning into wars, turning into unrest. A lot of chaos, at the same time stability within that chaos. And the question remains, what is the interest of the United States in that region particularly? So America first, yes, but what does it mean to stabilize the Middle East, for example, and keep the Middle East stable, <coughs> build stable economies? reduce polarization at national level and at regional level? Could that be in the form of peace brokerage, in more engaged uh, administration in forging peace and relationships and positive relationships? So basically, putting America or the United States first in the policy of the administration could mean positive interventions Selectively, probably, not at a mass scale. And collaboration and cooperation and creating the right environment for the evolution towards peace and stabilization by identifying the right brokers of peace, identifying and exercising the right pressures in the right places without necessarily having to have the same level of interventions as used to happen before. But a business cannot be left unfinished and there's also a moral and human responsibility towards 
stabilization because there's nothing that's not interconnected. Everything is interconnected. And, and has U.S. Inter involvement in, in the Middle East over the last year, has that been constructive? Uh, has it contributed to stability uh, mm -hmm. within the region? Or well, not? we have seen involvement in Syria, for example, with the uh, ISIS fight against ISIS. That has been quite positive and resulted in positive uh, and a positive outcome. Uh, it's not completely finished yet. There's, yeah. there's more work to be done. Uh, it's, uh, I think, the post-ISIS period that needs a clear strategy. Uh, the interventions from Russia, of course, um, have um, a, a big weight in, in the region. Um, we would hope to see a more constructive uh, approach and uh, supportive approach to fast-forwarding towards uh, peaceful solutions in, in the region. And I guess um, it's understandable that, you know, first year of administration, you're still formulating strategies and approaches and, and building links. Uh, but uh, more clarity needs to happen very quickly uh, because events are uh, evolving uh, in a rapid pace in the region and, and they need a closer look. And I'm going to want to come back uh, to talk about your prime minister. Uh, a little uh, detour that he took uh, to, to Saudi Arabia and what the significance of that is and uh, what the Saudi role is and what the U.S. role might be, but we'll come, we'll come back to that. Senator, Senator Corker, what is, uh, what's your, rea your, your own reaction to America first and how has it played out so far uh, with this administration? So I think you, you have to look at the genesis of, um, we have a country where a large part of our population feels alienated, feels like they, their lives have not ended up being where they thought they would be. They've worked hard all their life, might have gone to high school, a couple of years of community college, and for 20 or 30 years, they basically have worked and received the same amount of wages and things are costing more. And so, so you have to first realize that you have a president who's speaking to that audience. And... You know, a lot of times uh, in the foreign policy arena in particular, uh, we talk about lofty things, but we never speak about foreign policy in a manner that relates to the people that we actually represent. I mean, you know, we come to places like this, Davos or Munich or other places, and, you know, we talk amongst ourselves, but we fail sometimes to relate that back to the people that we actually serve. So... I think what you're seeing the president do is do that in spades. And uh, I know Mark Meadows is here, one of our great leaders in the House. Uh, he can attest to the fact that it's created almost a tribal support uh, for the president by many of the people that uh, are in this particular category, so, so, which is a lot of people, by the way. And it's happening, by the way, throughout Europe. Uh, similar kinds of things are, are happening. So. So, um, so the rhetoric is oriented that way. Um, but I look back at, uh, look, we had a, we had a uh, situation in Afghanistan where we were telegraphing when we were going to leave. And I have to give the president accolades for saying, we're going to, it's this conditions based. We're going to be there. And it actually gives us an opportunity there over time to broker a peace accord at some point. Whereas the other, people are just waiting out. So, you know, I could point to various, uh, obviously, TPP, both candidates ran against that. Um, you know, I would like to see us in an alliance that counters uh, uh, some what China's doing in the region. And it, as it turns what's out, it's the, not going to be what's, that. What's the state of our alliances at the moment? Do you think they're strong? Uh, uh, people have confidence, uh, lack of confidence. What, what is the state of play at the moment? You know, we're having a conversation back in the in the speaker's room, and I think that uh, there's a there's look, there's no question. There's unpredictability. People don't know what's going to happen. I mean, the president's own advisors, as Mark knows, will um, you know spend months trying to shape a policy. Uh, he will give feedback all along the way, and then finally at the end, he's going to make a decision. But uh, People in the room many times don't know what that is going to be. So um, I will say, again, uh, as you know, the president and I haven't always seen eye to eye. That's been well documented. Uh, on the other hand, I, I will tell you, I've seen where that unpredictability has been helpful in negotiations. I mean, we're talking like, what, right... Uh, what are you thinking of? Well, I'm thinking right now of the Iran situation. Uh, uh, I've been tasked with others to try to figure out a way forward domestically, and I know the administration's working with, uh, with our European allies. 
But I think the fact that they know that this president may well wake up one day and just spread it, um, which is not something, I, I didn't think it was a very good agreement on the front end, but once you're in it and you've already given up your leverage, it seems to me it's the kind of thing that we should stick with and try to improve. Um, but when they know that he could wake up one day, literally, just wake up and decide he's out of it. As I've tried to tell him, you can only do that one time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, let's do it. If we're going to do it, let's do it at a time when it's beneficial to us. I don't believe that's now. Do you think it's already changing uh, the behavior of Iran? Uh, I'm not talking about Iran. I'm talking about the fact that our European allies are far more interested in talking with us about what we might do as a result of the fact that we have a person who they know is somewhat un unpredictable in this way. So it doesn't always pay off. Um, you know, there are other instances where, you know, it, it's, it, it can work to our disadvantage. But uh, look, I, I'm, I, I look at the policies, and I know you want to get to the other panelists. I look at the policies that are actually being put, out, put in place, and, you know, the rhetoric's different. Um, yeah, we're... The tariffs didn't turn out to be quite what everybody thought they were going to be this week. Um, but I do think it speaks t to the people of our country. And I think that, uh, I will have to say, uh, has done an incredible job in rallying uh, those animal spirits in our own country. There's no question. I mean, this the, the, the deregulation that's taken place, the tax reform we just passed, it's affecting the world economy, the IMF reports, we all are aware of. So, so um, this making us strong economically, and I'll just stop with this. You read the national security report that just came out. And I think what's, what's striking about it is its incredible focus on our national security being so uh, tied to our own economic security. And uh, at the National Security Council, um, the head of our National Economic Council sits at that table, as do other people involved in economic issues. And so I do think that what is consistent, and there's been inconsistencies, what is consistent is the fact that I, th I think he views, I know he views, uh, tremendous economic strength on our part as being key to us being secure sure. in other ways. Sure. Let me ask uh, uh, Bob Kaplan and uh, Dr. Jin uh, to, to maybe put this in some broader context. So, uh, uh, Bob, what... Talk about this. I mean, is there anything really unusual about America First? I mean, we've had nation states since forever. Yep. Uh, people have looked out for their own interests. I saw a comment uh, recently that said in, in the past, uh, this was one commentator saying, in the past, the United States uh, spoke nobly and acted selfishly. Now it's just being more honest. It's both speaking selfishly and acting selfishly. Is that uh, a misreading, or is that, where, where does this fit into All right. history? In terms of American history, um, there was a great political analyst historian of the mid-20th century, Teddy White, Theodore Wright, White, and he wrote, that there was always a 30% of the American people who belonged to no particular party, who were suspicious of allies, suspicious of foreign aid, tended to have a higher opinion of Douglas MacArthur than, uh, than Dwight Eisenhower, supported Joseph McCarthy. And they were like a moving 20%, 30%, and they were always there. The, what's happened this time is that they attach themselves to one candidate because that one candidate spoke to their experience, which was, and I can tell you this firsthand, I've driven all across America recently, is that outside of the two coasts, outside of the university and college towns, outside of, a few, outside of most state capitals, not all, it's a complicated pic picture, life in America does not look very good. Uh, you go from town to town of 20, 30,000 where the main street is hollowed out, the stores are boarded up, and these people have really suffered. So that 30% combined with how globalization has split the American people, I, and, and I would add a third element, which is that America was a very inspiring, successful democracy in the print and typewriter age. But it is unclear to me that it can, it can continue as such in the digital video era. 
because the digital video era is changing the nature of the American people in, term, you know, in terms of how they think, how they get their information, and how they get their news. So um, to me, Trump may not be an aberration. He may be the first digital video age president married to populism. Um, so, so that's the domestic picture. Um, on, on the foreign picture, um, what I see is that um, the United States functionally is a liberal maritime power. You know, its navy is its primary day-to-day -day strategic instrument. It protects the seas for free trade, you know, and allies access to hydrocarbons. And with that seafaring maritime great power tradition, like Venice more than Rome, uh, America has, has, has generally been able to project power better by supporting free trade. Mm -hmm. uh, because free trade goes together with democracy. It's a perfect fit and a perfect way for America to project power. So I think that when, Amer when, tr when President Trump signaled a withdrawal from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, moving away from free trade, that was the biggest self-inflicted error that, you know, that America has made in Asia in decades, because it reduced America's vision for Asia. It shrunk it down to just help us out on North Korea, and we want a better deal with China on bi bilateral trade. And, and I think the effect is corrosive going around the world. If you go to the Middle East, what's going on with the US and Mexico, I think our allies in Europe are far less uh, sure of us, because deterrence has to be proclaimed forcefully all the time, or else it doesn't work. And if so, if you get a president who doesn't seem fully committed all the time from the very beginning to NATO, that undermines deterrence, if there's any question mark whatsoever. Dr. Jen, why don't you uh, step in here and, and uh, talk about what, what are the consequences of this, this policy? Uh, you know, we've had, heard a lot of warnings here at, at uh, the World Economic Forum in Davos uh, that uh, this means the luster is off of globalization, as Prime Minister Modi from India uh, put it. Uh, other people are foreseeing a sort of a halt to globalization or a slowdown in it. Uh, and we have actually seen some uh, stagnation in trade flows and currency flows and things and bank, international bank lending and things like that. Uh, what, is, uh, what do you foresee? Well, like, you know, first of all, and I'll offer a Chinese perspective on the first question, which is, look, you know, if President Trump says America first, the Chinese would say, hey, we get it. You know, which country really doesn't put their, you know, country first? Germany does and everyone else does, except that President Trump is more vocal. I think the real question here is, do American first policies really put America first? And I think that there's a clarification that we need to make with regard to globalization, which touches upon your question. We blame a lot on globalization and trade, uh, where in fact job losses are you know, known to be much more associated with technology. And um, are these, uh, you know, the imminent trade wars coming, especially with regard to China, um, this kind of trade pressure, really a good thing for the US? Uh, if China stops buying, uh, you know, aircrafts, 180,000 jobs. If it stops importing uh, soybeans, you know, 10% of some uh, local population of Missouri depends on, you know, exporting soybeans. The state of the academic findings today is that on net, China has also created, Chinese imports has created um, jobs through services. And it's about balance, the jobs that have been displaced and the jobs that have been created. We also forget that bilateral trade flows in terms of imports versus exports completely mismeasure the real trade activity because it's global supply chain. Um, China, for example, uh, China's value added in, the, uh, in making iPhone is only 4%. But if it stops producing key component parts, I mean, that kind of completely disrupts the entire flow. So, it's not by the trade deficit measurements from the traditional statistics that tell you this, um, uh, the, you know, paint the whole picture. Then the, the dollar uh, being the reserve currency, we need trust of the dollar. Uh, uh, you know, we talked about unpredictability. Sometimes we would even say it's a bit random. 
right? So, um, you know, buying treasury bills. What we found is that um, uh, countries that are U.S. allies versus countries that have their own, their own nuclear weapons, um, they have a huge difference, percentage, 35 percentage points difference in how much U.S. treasuries they hold. So the economic consequences of, you know, kind of America first, I just want to put it out there. Do they actually put America first? Okay, so we've, uh, well, we've seen some concrete action from the, from the U.S. administration just in the last few days. Uh, tariffs on uh, washing machines and solar panels. Um, that affects China to some degree. Uh, how big a deal is that? Uh, does it foreshadow uh, more severe sac sanctions? And if there were more severe uh, uh, trade actions against China, how do you think China is likely to react? Uh, you know, if it stops at pol uh, solar panels and washing machines, I think it's okay. Part of the reason is that China has excess capacity in solar panels. And also, China is actually trying to get rid of a lot of the lower end manufacturing. Uh, so it's kind of an external force that will force that transition. So I would say that's okay, but it is a signal. And if there is more pressure um, for another onslaught of trade, you know, tariffs coming, I can guarantee that the Chinese government will have a very strong stance, most importantly because it is no longer the case that if you have strong domestic pressure, which will come from businesses, which will come from Chinese people, that the government will not respond to that. They absolutely will. So I think that Chinese government will absolutely have retaliatory um, a position if this gets much worse. And what about Latin America? Uh, uh, obviously, the president has said uh, some strong things about uh, about trade from Mexico and from other countries in Latin America, uh, what, uh, what would be the reaction? Let's say if uh, he rips up uh, NAFTA, uh, that would have a dramatic impact on Mexico. Uh, and uh, if he, he's also complained about the trade deficits with other Latin American countries as well. He's paying close attention to the trade deficit with each country yes. that he's dealing with. Uh, how does Latin America deal with that? What would be the impact in, in, uh, in Mexico and Latin America? And, and how, what kind of response would you expect? Uh, first, I, I want to finish something I was saying. I was talking about the rhetoric against migration, but it's not only the rhetoric. There is a decision against the TPS that, of course, affects uh, mainly migrants from the Northern Triangle. And that may create, of course, some social unrest and may bring even more uh, illegal immigra immigration to, to the United States. About trade, uh, what we have seen is mainly the Mexican case and uh, some issues with Argentina that uh, later, uh, they were resolved later. The thing is, um, um, and some threats against the uh, FTA with uh, Central America. <clears throat> My concern is that, uh, uh, and of course, uh, some uh, uh, Latin American countries were affected by the uh, by the TPP. The thing is that uh, first of all, countries will try to protect their interests in negotiations with the United States, as Mexico is doing. So that means uh, a very hard task, but of course, uh, feeling confident that they may be able to uh, to achieve uh, enough protection of their interest. If it is not the case, of course, what you do, you look for new trade partners. And it's what mainly uh, trade partners of the TPP are trying to do these days. Um, I think that uh, is, in fact, is a consolidated space in Latin America that China has. China is the main trade partner of Uruguay, Argentina, Chile, Peru, Colombia, <coughs> and we can count on. So, uh, it's already a space, a space that is belong, be, belongs in the trade, uh, uh, mutual trade to, to them. Uh, this TPP was a way of recovering part of that market. So now it's completely abandoned in the uh, now conditions. So people will try to keep improving those conditions and keep improving that trade with, 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 with Asia that they, they have. So is, it, is all of this, uh, maybe you can ask a lot of people, is, is this uh, opening up just an opportunity for China? I mean, there's been a lot of commentary to that effect, that China is going to, that the United States is creating a vacuum, uh, that China is going to step in. Uh, I saw that the foreign minister of Chile recently said the U.S. had in fact created a vacuum and that China would be stepping in. Senator Corker, what are you? Is that? Are you concerned about that? Are you? Uh, 
nonchalant about it? Uh, no, not nonchalant. I, I think that China um, has for years and is stepping it up even more, had a strategic vision that is long and is investing resources, creating alliances, creating relationships, sometimes not to the benefit of the countries they're doing it with because of the way they finance it and the way they build it. But uh, there's no question that they are very aggressive. We, uh, we are lacking in that regard, and, and we hope over the next couple of weeks to be taking some steps to, to help counter some of the, um, and I'm really talking about more the, the development side of things. Um, but no, I think, uh, I think from the standpoint of a country having a vision, implementing that vision, putting resources, big resources behind it, um, there's no question that, uh, and, and TPP couldn't agree more. Um, both candidates, by the way, in the race, uh, one who actually had been kind of involved in it and creating it uh, on the other side of the aisle, uh, were those speaking to uh, the issues that you're talking about between the coasts and that Mark and I see all the time in our own states. And, uh, and so, you know, it just wasn't politically palatable from their perspective, although I'm not sure about that, okay? I'm not sure. But it has left us in a weakened position as it relates to, um, again, if you, if you think about the economic alliances and how much, what that means from a national security standpoint, it's really hurt us on two fronts. Um, and you, we have to remember that these countries have a domestic uh, audience also. They went out on a limb, agreed to an agreement with the United States of America, and then now uh, we're not a part of it. So it's, it's been very damaging. And yes, um, I don't think this is the first year. I don't think the administration has yet um, fully thought how they're going to try to counter that. I do want to say as it relates to the Western Hemisphere, it's my understanding that the White House uh, is going to spend tremendous amounts of time and effort in this next year uh, in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, hopefully that will be welcomed, but, uh, and I think that it will, but I think there's going to be a tremendous emphasis on that. Uh, Dr. Chen, uh, yeah. could you address that? I mean, is, is China, does this just open the way for China in Latin America and elsewhere? I think China did not expect um, this kind of opening, especially in certain areas, as quickly as it happened. And China also harbors no illusion that it can fill the, ro the, the role that the United States have filled in many, many aspects of the role. Look, let's face it, it's a middle income country, developing country. It's big, but it's still poor. Um, however, uh, as President Xi has you know, put out a new kind of global model, a new platform for economic cooperation through infrastructure, I think that is real leadership. And I think he wants to define his legacy by creating, enabling this kind, kind of global cooperation just as post-war United States you know, pushed for more universalism. But let me just say the reality, even though we've heard of you know, the, the greater cooperation of other countries with China, is that it is, it's very tricky. Um, with the Belt Road Initiative, China has over and again met with so much political resistance, even in the countries that they're trying to help finance infrastructure. Uh, one little anecdote helps you know, the, clarify the, 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 story, the question, the Sri Lanka. Um, needed a lot of infrastructure. China wanted to finance it. And then because of political parties, they decided to side more with the US and India. And they were waiting for the promised loans, and it never came. And they wanted to switch back to China. And China's like, uh, I don't think so. Hmm. Many stories like that. Interesting. Uh, let's turn to the Middle East uh, and back to, to Lebanon, uh, because there's been a lot happening there. Mm -hmm. um, so. Um, the United States has seen, as, has seen it as in its interest to closely align with Saudi Arabia in order to counter Iran. Um, and, um, and the rivalry between the Saudis and the Iranians really seems to be unfolding in a very tense way in, in Lebanon. Uh, the Prime Minister Hariri uh, sort of made, had this mysterious stay uh, in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, he announced his intention to resign. Uh, later rescinded, re returned. Uh, 
well, what, is, what is going on here exactly? Uh, and <laughs> How much what do you we see? Have? We finally need an explanation, and yeah. only you can provide it. Uh, what do you see is, and what do you see is, uh, what are the Saudis doing, and what, how do you, what do you think is the U.S. role in all of this? What is, what role is it playing? Right. I think um, this is a, uh, well, first of all, what happened happened in the past. Now we're looking forward how we can actually move forward well, with the results exactly? of what happened. But the what resignation happened? of our prime minister uh, had triggered or was triggered by an escalation in rhetoric coming out of Lebanon a specific uh, faction in Lebanon uh, that uh, was anti-Arab uh, uh, in general and was quite aggressive against our Arab uh, uh, friends and uh, uh, countries and allies. So basically that, that triggered um, a, a long internal reaction as well from various political parties in Lebanon. And the government has pretty much everyone represented in it from, through a democratic process basically, and that's democracy in general. The, uh, the challenge was always how to keep Lebanon away from all the conflicts that are happening uh, around the region without interfering in any conflicts and without any conflicts interfering in the stability of Lebanon. A line was crossed at that point in time. The resignation had readjusted the position of the government uh, in order to get everyone to agree that this government has one position and the official position of Lebanon is to remain neutral from all these uh, conflicts. And that was achieved uh, post-resignation. Therefore, he went back on his resignation and now we're back to business as usual and uh, focusing on internal things, Lebanon first. Well, what is business so, as usual? Uh, obviously, Hezbollah has a, a big role in, in Lebanon, has a tremendous yeah. amount of influence. Uh, Saudi Arabia is tremendously concerned about sure. Iranian influence. Uh, uh, via Hezbollah and other, and other ways. Uh, has that changed? Uh, let's split the two things. The, there are people in Lebanon who vote for members of parliament. They get elected and they get participation in, in the government. So uh, that situation has been developing over a long period of time. And there's a group of the Lebanese who participate in this government uh, through a democratic process. That's one thing. Uh, there are people also in this government who refuse to have any arms outside the authority of the government and to refuse to have um, anyone taking a decision on war and peace outside the decision of the sovereign government of Lebanon. And any arms outside the Lebanese armed forces are not accepted. And this is the view of many people in this government. So that's one thing. This is also a view shared by many other countries as well. Uh, particularly, uh, I'm sure the United States would share that view uh, and has expressed that view quite clearly. Saudi Arabia has been quite vocal about that as well. So there's an alignment of many people around that, that point. Now, how do we get there without actually causing damage to the uh, rest of the country, to the institutions of the country that we are trying to build? Uh, to the banking sector of the country, that's a question that has to be addressed very, very clearly, particularly by the U.S. administration, who are today making major decisions about sanctions against Hezbollah, for example. So how do we uh, make that happen in the most efficient and effective way? While U.S. doing what is in the U.S. interest, Saudi Arabia is doing what is in Saudi Arabia's interest, while also Lebanon is trying to do what's in Lebanese interest, how can we find the common ground to get through this period as positively, as quickly as possible without engaging Lebanon in the regional conflicts that are much bigger than the scope and scale of what the Lebanese government can achieve single-handedly. On top of that, we're impacted by those conflicts directly. We have a million and a half refugees in Lebanon from Syria. Uh, the world is trying to help on a humanitarian level, but we're paying the bill, we're actually fronting uh, and delivering all the services on the ground. Uh, so we're providing a, a global service, a global community service in Lebanon as a government. Uh, so Lebanon needs that support, needs that global community support. And if it is in the interest of the United States to create credibility, uh, stability in the region, to also uh, counter uh, um, the, the Iranian uh, uh, spread across the region and influence, uh, there's a lot to be done on encouraging 
uh, growth, prosperity, stability in, in places like Lebanon well, you, you know, as a democratic you, model. But you know what uh, the Hezbollah leader, Nasrallah, has, has said, that he said that the Saudis asked Israel to wage war, uh, to attack uh, Lebanon, uh, and that, uh, and presumably, the Saudis were doing this with at the behest of the United States and, and others. So, is that do you do you believe that? I no, I wouldn't go that that far in this analysis. I think uh, there's a lot of rhetoric coming out of mm -hmm. different uh, different parts of of Lebanon and the region. I think what what we need to focus on today is the solution of the wider region, particularly in Israel particularly the peace solution in, in Palestine and in Israel, uh, in Syria, uh, and all the uh, other, uh, other, other wars in, in the region have to be addressed in one way or another. Uh, I think going through peaceful negotiations is one thing. Putting the right amount of pressure is also another thing. But again, we cannot dictate a policy uh, on, on any country or entity. We're there trying to also protect our own interests and stabilize the country, stabilize the region. Sure. And we do hope that in one way or another, there will be a positive overlap of interests between the United States, Europe, the Middle Eastern countries that are engaged in, in this discussion, and what we have at the local level in Lebanon. Right. We're going to turn to questions in uh, just a few minutes, but uh, let me ask uh, Bob Kaplan. Uh, you know, some people have said that we're, we're really making too much of uh, President Trump and uh, America first, that he's really a paper tiger, uh, that there are a lot of things that he said he would do that he hasn't done, that he hasn't imposed any really severe sanctions against China, he hasn't declared it a currency manipulator, he hasn't ripped up NAFTA, he hasn't ripped up the JCPOA with regard to Iran as he pledged during the campaign. Uh, what's your sense? Uh, is he more bark than he's bite? bite? Is he, in fact, a paper tiger? I, I think, yes, he is more, uh, uh, you know, his bite is less than his bark. But, here's the but, is the United States for 75 years was, a glo was the, you know, was a global leader. Um, you know, the, America, uh, the world's chief military power and economic power, the U.S. dollars, the reserve currency. And when you're the chief, when you're the leading world nation in terms of how power is perceived, your, your bark matters a lot. Everything you say is infinitely analyzed. It, you, know, it, uh, 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 you know, nation states you know, make decisions based on statements coming out of the White House all the time. It matters more when you're a leader. When you're a leader, the, you know, the rhetoric has to sink, not perfectly, but it has to sink more or less with what you're actually doing. So that if your rhetoric is, you know, is very unpredictable and you have what I believe is a very weak State Department, that undermines your hard power too. Because, you know, because power works in sync. You move ships around the world, your Secretary of State says something, the White House makes a statement, it all has to be coordinated. And the strongest American presidents have been those who have been able to co coordinate and orchestrate the various, the various kinds of power that's available in Washington. When you have an administration that simply cannot do that or won't do that, it undermines the reputation for power. Is that, is that what's States. happening, Senator? Uh, is that the United States' reputation for power is being undermined, uh, bad communication between the White or coordination between the White House and the State Department, statements that, uh, that seem uh, to be more threatening and no actual follow-up, at least not immediately, as pledged. Uh, what, what is your take on that? Well, um, I've sort of had this conversation openly. Maybe I shouldn't have. But um, I, I do think that as everybody was adjusting during the first year, Secretary Tillerson went out, would be out doing something in China relative to North Korea or whatever. And as he was doing so and making progress, and I spend a lot of time with him, and I think he gives, by the way, very sound advice to the president. And by the way, he and, he and our Secretary of Defense, Mattis, never go to the National Security Council or to the president without them both agreeing in advance, which is not, not the norm uh, in many administrations. So I know he's giving very sound advice. And 
there have been occasions where um, communications of different types uh, came out and undermined that and basically uh, were, were setbacks to us. I do think that's changed uh, to a degree. And I've, I feel that, uh, I feel with Tillerson, there's been a reprieve of, of sorts. And I think that uh, this is just my observation. This is me saying this. Um, I think he feels uh, more secure in his job today. And uh, I think you're seeing more of a, a sync up in, uh, in that regard. So um, I do think, yeah, sure, during the first year, we, some things happened that uh, uh, probably didn't need to happen. Uh, we can open up for questions. Uh, yes, right here. Businesses around the world, uh, you know, seeing American engagement being very important. It strikes me that I buy into the theory that America first has resulted in America alone. We're isolated on trade. We're isolated on Paris. We're isolated on looking at human rights vis-a-vis -vis our allies. Um, we're isolated on the question of the capital of Israel and the president's comments which, you know, we don't have a tape, we can't prove it, about uh, countries in Africa and Haiti have isolated the United States such that uh, it, it does seem like this is an America alone uh, approach, not an America first approach. Your reaction? Well, I, look, uh, the, some of the rhetoric that has been utilized um, has, has isolated people within our own country, right? I mean, it's, it's caused people to step back um, at the same time, the United States is very important in all of these areas. I know the Paris Accord we're not a part of now. I wouldn't, I think at some point you may see us back in and there may be on, on, on different terms. But I, I, don't see, I don't see us today as America alone. I do see us, uh, people looking at us in a little bit different light and and I think we probably have burnt some goodwill that built up over many, many years. And, and uh, you know, it's going to take some time to, to rebuild that over time. And hopefully, um, you know, I don't know what's going to happen Friday afternoon at 2.30 or whenever the speech is. But hopefully uh, what we'll see is the beginning of, uh, of, of an understanding that that has taken place and, and some bridge building beginning. Uh, there you go. Right there. Yeah. Hi, my name is Yasmin Shahata. I'm an entrepreneur from Egypt. Uh, I wanted to ask a question also to the senator. Uh, first of all, thank you for being a voice of reason at times when the world is watching and, and happy to hear that. But regarding the Middle East, how can the U.S. suddenly decide America first after so many years of being so heavily involved in the region without many of us even wanting that involvement. And then if it is America first, then why are we still, why, why the need to recognize the cap Jerusalem as a capital at a, such a controversial time when the U.S. has no interest in being engaged and actually solving this problem and all the other problems? You know, not to mention the fact that countries like ours will never see democracy because our governments are continuously supported by the U.S. and we're never, you know, and now human rights abuses are ignored. Mm. So how, how do you see America First in this context? Well, um, I'll start by saying uh, it, I think it's far more difficult to be the president of Egypt than it is the president of the United States uh, with 95 or 6 million people, 700,000 new young people entering the market every year, two and a half million people uh, added, added 28,000 classrooms needed today, healthcare system in shambles, terrorism in the Sinai. And it seems to me that, that we need to, in spite of the fact there are these, and I've had these conversations with President CC, in spite of the things you're mentioning, which are, in, you know, to, a, to an extent, true, um, the fact is we don't want Egypt to fail. And so, you know, we, it's, you know, we have to continue to work with them and support them, actually for the people of Egypt's good too, um, where situations are not ideal as it relates to moving along and dealing with NGOs and dealing with human rights and dealing with many of the things you laid out. But I, I was not 
in favor of the last administration's quick pullback from Egypt in the manner that they did. Um, to, to Jerusalem, um, look, I, I think what you see in this president is uh, when he has friends, he, he, he goes all out. I mean, you saw that with Saudi Arabia. And in many cases, not really asking for much in return, just boom. Uh, probably the same, we'll see. I don't think any real commitments were made on, on the side of Israel. But again, boom, a commitment was made. Friendship is there. And, and uh, a lot of times it doesn't, I don't think it's thought through in some cases uh, in a strategic way necessarily. Um, but, uh, and, you know, it did happen in fairness at a time when the Sunni, when the Sunni population is closer to Israel uh, than it's been in a long time, right? I mean, it's really, you know, it is closer to Israel than it's been in a long time. And, and I, and I want to say this, the back-channel conversations that we've had, I don't, I don't think it really created quite the stir that, that people think. I know there was a lot of rhetoric that came out. I'm not defending or I'm just observing what has happened. So, so um, as far as us being out of the Middle East, I do think, um, as was stated clearly during the campaign, uh, and, and most any time I talk with him on the phone or in person about the Middle East, Iraq comes up. Um, you know, he thinks it's the worst thing we've ever done foreign policy-wise. Um, and so you're, you're seeing a natural pullback. We're not, we're not leading right now in Syria the way we should be. I mean, you look what's happened in Sochi here soon. I mean, the Russians are... Um, but I will say Tillerson's doing a... I think he's doing a pretty good job right now with Putin in beginning the process. You saw Putin committed to the UN uh, uh, process. I'm talking too long, so I'm going to stop. Uh, thank you for the questions. Thank you. <laughs> Did I signal that? I don't know. I thought um, I heard you breathe deep. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you know, you don't look like her, but you acted a little bit like my wife. So. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, well, she's a lovely person. So. <laughs> um, question. Thank you. I'm Tim Snyder. I'm a, I'm a historian. The, the thing which struck me most about this panel was that the majority of the panelists spent significant time on the domestic problems of the United States of America. That seems to me to be the striking thing. The second striking thing is that in a conversation about America first, we don't actually have a sense of what the domestic policies would be which would address that, let's say that permanent 30%, or let's say those workers in Missouri, or let's say your constituents in, in Tennessee. So my, my question or my concern about America first is its circular character. It's very easy to kill time and fill up space by talking about America first. The danger, I think, of the suggestion is that our domestic problems are the fault of others, are always the fault of others, and that they can be solved by blaming others and by protectionism, which I have to say I think is not the case. And I worry about, I come from, the, I come from a place that went 76% for Trump, which has done very poorly out of globalization. I understand exactly the animal spirits you're talking about. What I'm concerned about is that without a domestic policy, which actually did do something to put Americans first, this is all gonna turn out to be circular and leave us much worse off than we started, question mark. <laughs> I guess. I should answer that. You, you, yeah. you, uh, Senator, you responded yeah. to a lot of questions. I'm sure yeah. the others have things to say. Too. Maybe uh, spot. Bob Kaplan. Yeah, could, uh, what, what I would say is uh, I'm not an economist, and I didn't read all the pages of the new tax plan. But from what I can gather from it and what experts have told me, it's a tax plan that doesn't deal with the problem that Timothy Snyder point, you know, pointed out. It's a tax plan that essentially the wealthier you are, the better you do out of it. Um, and, that, um, it's, and, and, you know, and if that's the case, the tax plan will exacerbate you know, all the problems that you, know, you, know, that, uh, that, that you, that, that you spoke about. So and the, the, you know, the degree to which you can get domestic policy to solve domestic problems to me, has to start with, 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 with the tax structure um, and then with a lot of other problems. And to me, the tax plan w went completely in the other direction or partially in the other direction. 
there another question? Yeah. Yes. Maybe to build on what Timothy was just saying, is so my worry is when you have um, foreign policy where you use foreign entities sort of to blame for certain problems which are domestic. And as you just said, uh, Mr. Kaplan, a lot of things which were talked about in the primaries and in the campaigning haven't been you know, fulfilled in policy yet. As the key backers of the president see they're not getting ahead, it's not improving, um, and his base might be dwindling, my worry is that it gets more extreme um, in order to, to show more action. And foreign policy becomes even more changing quickly, unpredictable for our foreign um, partners. And I would love to hear from the foreign partners how you think about this. And I think that's a worry about I have with a more and more populist government in the US as a US citizen living actually abroad right now, but actually coming from a German heritage, as you can tell from my um, accent. So I think this global attitude around this is, is really something I'm interested in to hear. Sure. From our perspective, actually, I was just thinking as, as this conversation was going on that the current administration, the America First uh, driven administration, has been more engaged in the activities in the Middle East than probably the previous administration. The previous administration had pulled back much more than what we see today. Uh, so we're seeing a rebalance being, being established, no doubt. And if we talk globally, um, there's no doubt also that there's a general trend around the world post-2008 crisis to refocus internally, retrench on corporate level, on government level, all institutions and entities have actually refocused internally, going down to some places at the city level. And we saw the rise of cities, not just nation states, but city states. So that's quite natural after a crisis of such a scale. Um, populism rose as a result because of your internal focus, and that's natural as well. But that doesn't mean when you put yourself and your interests first, that you're actually isolating yourself and you're enclosing yourself. Uh, there's also a way of having your interests first by engaging in globalization and getting certain terms set the right way that put your interests first. So there's a new way of looking at globalization, I would say. Uh, we're seeing it now from the eyes of localization. But in reality, we're seeing more globalization happen through this locally focused uh, policy of many countries, many sub-national entities. And as far as global partners are concerned, it's, it's a time to reset priorities and rebuild relationships from a slightly different uh, angle. The question remains, for those countries who play a global role, can they afford to leave a gap or an opening for other countries to come in. It's a competitive time now for global space. And while you're entrenching and focusing internally, you can't just drop the ball internationally altogether and you know, keep an open space for others. And this could be good news for others as well. So this is why I think a revisit of the definition of globalization from a local perspective and the concept probably of America first today as we're discussing it is an eye-opener that putting your country's interest first doesn't mean you're actually totally a protectionist policymaker, but you might also be a, a globalizing um, agent from a slightly different angle from what we have been used to before. So we have just uh, like a minute and a half left. So I Dr. Just, Jan, if, I just, quickly. I just want to add one thing we haven't really touched. These policies fuels nationalism. Mm -hmm. That's the danger. And we're already feeling in China with the domestic pressure. So uh, very quickly, uh, in a sentence or two, that's it. Uh, tell me, uh, each of you, what do you want to hear from President Trump when he makes his speech? Senator? Um, I want to hear a very positive role from him, um, a, a positive statement about America's role in the world, and, um, and an explanation of America first in a way that uh, does not, from the viewpoint of some in the audience and, and people around the world, um, 
make it look as if and make it appear as if and and actually he will show actions after uh, that shows that we're not it's not about America being alone it's about uh, obviously taking care of America's economic interest but at the same time knowing of the important role that we play in the world Dr. Jim that even with America first policies America would still continue to assume key responsibilities as a key nation and there is a great room for global coordination Deputy Prime Minister Haldani. I'd love to see clarity on uh, the plan for the Middle East, if there's a plan in place. Uh, and I'd like to really understand how the uh, statement on Jerusalem uh, recently uh, would help any kind of solutions in the Middle East, given that it has given a, a lot of material for those uh, who oppose the United States in the Middle East to get more popular. Secretary General. That he is committed to bring democracy back to Venezuela. And that uh, for us is the main issue today in the continent. So that could be the most supportive action that he may have. Bob Kaplan. That America first means American values first. And American values are impossible to implement or to project without allies. And therefore, America needs to strengthen its alliances with like-minded nations. And you, know, and you begin from there, which means more involvement rather than withdrawal from Europe from from many other places. Great. Uh, thank you all for participating. Thank you all for coming.